All right, welcome back to another After Dark, everyone. Um, speaking of somebody that I... Childhood me would be pissed off at me for doing a YouTube channel for this long and not talking about Pistol Pete Maravich. Let's put it that way. Um, I grew up um, as a kid... Okay, I have to thanks... Uh, there was a movie that came out when I was, I was a kid in the 80s called The Pistol. And I used to watch it religiously with my brother, like all the time. Uh, we didn't own it, but I swear it was on all the time. Somehow we always managed to watch that movie, and we had it recorded on VHS. So, yeah, we watched it all the time. I don't know about you guys if you've ever seen it. I haven't seen it since I was a kid, so I don't know how well it held up. But I'll tell you, when I was a kid, all that got me doing is dribbling the damn ball, like nonstop. Like, I would watch the movie, and then I would just dribble down the sidewalk, dribble on the, on the street, dribble everywhere I could possibly go. I was dribbling the basketball, and it's all thanks to this movie. Um, and it's funny enough, like, I ended up being a big fan of Steve Nash later on as an adult, and it kind of makes sense why, because Pistol and, and Nash had some similarities. But to be completely honest, I'm sure there's a lot I don't know about Pistol Pete. Because I just knew what that movie told me. I never got to see him play when, you know, when he was actually in the league. So let's check this out. This is called How Good Was Pistol Pete Maravich Actually? And this is by Nonstop. And this is what we usually do when we're just introducing a player. Um, and if we all enjoy it, then we can do deeper dives. And you guys can suggest some videos that will cover some deeper topics with Pistol Pete. And uh, that's always the way the flow seems to go, and it seems to be working. So let's not mess with it. Uh, I'm going to link the original video down below in the description if you want to watch it without my commentary. Everybody else, please leave a like to this video. It helps out a ton. And a guy, a video like this about Pistol Pete, not going to get a lot of viewers. Um, the class, It seems like anybody pre-90s doesn't get a lot of viewers here. But that's okay. But my whole point is, if you want it to get pushed out to get more viewers on it, so, so more people know about Pistol Pete, you know what to do. Hit that like button, throw in a comment, and let's do this, all right? All right, here we go, everybody. Hope you all are having a good night. Pete Maravich, better known as Pistol Pete, was one of the best NBA players of the 70s, a dribbling magician, outstanding shooter, and arguably the greatest NCAA player ever. Pete was playing a brand of basketball 40 years ahead of his time, yep. and players today can't even do some of the stuff the Pistol did in the 70s. Here's the career retrospective of Pete Maravich. Yeah, he's, how he's a running gun, man. He's running gun. Showmanship influenced future NBA stars, who stole a lot of their moves from the Pistol. Early Life and the Origin of the Pistol Pete Maravich was born in 1947, and basketball was in his blood. His father, Press, was a professional player for two years in the NBL and BAA, two leagues that merged and became the NBA in 1949. Press then started coaching... Hold on, what was that league? NBL? Two leagues that merged... Press was a professional player for two years in the NBL and BAA. Whoa. NBL and the BAA became the NBA. I didn't know about that. Two leagues that merged and became the NBA in 1949. Press then started coaching, and because of his job, the Maravich family had to move a lot. The only constant for Press and his son Pete was basketball, which was a dish served for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. While Pete was only an infant, he already started dribbling, and by the age of seven, he started playing organized basketball. When Press Damn. Maravich coached at Clemson University, he would always bring Pete to practices and games, and the two would always talk about basketball in some shape or form. Pete would dribble the basketball on his way to school, while he rode on a bike, and even slept with the ball. At the age of 12, he was okay, I used to do that too. I think I saw that in the movie. I used to sleep at the basketball. I know when I started playing guitar, uh, when I was a teenager, I used to sleep with my guitar as well. And like, I, it's crazy because like, I'd be like playing the guitar and then I'd fall asleep. And every time I'd kind of gain some consciousness, my fingers would start moving on the fretboard again. You know, it's just a... Uh, I don't know what it is, I, but I yeah, that's the origin. I got that from Pistol Pete because I used to sleep with the basketball all the time. Some people had a teddy bear. No, nah, I had a basketball. 
practicing up to 10 hours a day. His father taught him the fundamentals, but Pete loved basketball so much that he started improvising, and countless hours in the gym all alone gave birth to some of the most spectacular moves the NBA has ever seen. But more on that later. As a freshman, Pete started playing for Daniels High School in Clemson at the age of 14, but he barely played on a team filled with seniors. And even when Pete would come into the game, the older guys avoided passing him the ball. The crowd also laughed when they saw the small, skinny 14-year-old on the floor, which pissed the hell out of Pete. However, one single shot changed everything. Pete's team was down by one in the last seconds. Because he hardly ever had the ball, the opponents never guarded Maravich. <laughs> so the Daniels coach decided to pass the ball to Pete. He got the open shot and made the game winner. And it was then that he received the nickname Pistol Pete. It was given to him by a reporter who noticed that when Pete shot towards the basket, it looked like he was pulling out a gun. The nickname remains, and the legend of the Pistol Pete was born. NCAA wow. go. A name like that came from just a reporter. Oh. After graduating from high school, Pete and his father decided that Pete should go to prep school for another year. Pete was six foot three at the time, but he weighed just over 130 pounds. What? Six three, 130 pounds? He should be at least 205. That is way too skinny. Holy crap. And could not withstand physical duels at the college level. Yeah, no so. kidding. Yeah, he'd get pushed all over the place. Yeah. Hobie's going to have to take a lot of protein to catch up and eat a lot of food. He spent a year at the Edwards Military Academy, where he grew to six foot five and Damn. bulked up to a respectable 160 pounds, which improved his game tremendously. At the same time, his father Press got the head coaching job at Louisiana State, which was known for football, but had a minuscule basketball program. Press asked Pete to attend LSU and join him, which Pete bluntly rejected because he wanted to play for a renowned basketball college. However, after Press threatened to kick him out of the house, <laughs> Press decided to join his father at LSU. Under his father's tutelage, Pete became a superstar and would set records that will likely never get broken. In his freshman year, he averaged 43.6 points per game, but because of the rules in the 70s, freshmen were not allowed to play on the varsity team. The crowd at LSU would often watch the freshman games and then leave once Pete's game was done. That's so dumb. If you're good enough, then you're good enough. You're at the same school. That's a dumb rule. As far as like freshmen should be able to play varsity. Why not? You're already going to the damn school. Why not? If you're good enough, you're good enough. Get in there. And wasn't even interested in watching the varsity team. Pete led the freshmen to a 17-1 record that season, while the varsity team, led by Press, had a record of 3-23. They could use his help. In his sophomore year, Pete was able to play for the varsity team and immediately asserted himself as the primary option on offense Damn. with 43.8 points on average. 43.8 points a game. NCAA's top scorer that season, and he repeated that feat as a junior with 44.2 points. Good Lord. And as a senior with 44.5 points per game, God. along with two National College Player of the Year awards. In the three years he spent on the varsity team, Pistol Pete scored 3,667 points in 83 games, averaging an incredible 44.2 points per game. He owns almost every NCAA scoring record to this day. And what's even more impressive is that he broke all those records in the era without the three-point shot. Former LSU coach Dale Brown charted- Wow, yeah, without a three-point shot. That's crazy every shot Maravich scored. And because he shot many jumpers from long distances, Brown calculated that Pete would have averaged an astounding 57 points per game if his long jumpers counted as threes. Wow. A globe trotter wow. in the NBA. Pistol Pete was the most known player in the country by the time he finished college, and he had plenty of options where to continue his career. He was contacted by half the ABA teams, many NBA teams, but also the Harlem Globetrotters, who offered Maravich $1 million to join them. Maravich That's crazy. A million dollars back then? And a heart. Okay, wow, double whammy. That just shows what a phenom he was. One, a million dollars to be a Harlem Globetrotter is ridiculous. That's a ridiculous amount of money in the end of 70s. Like, that's uh, adjusted for inflation. Maybe phew, the NBA players were not making that money at all back then. I mean, 20 million, maybe? Like maybe 20 million today, something like that. At least 10 to 20, somewhere in there. It's got to be. Um, number two, um, I'm not sure. I don't watch the Globe Trotters anymore, but I did a lot when I was a kid. And I will say, hold on. But also the Harlem Globe. Um, 
Okay, uh, Pistol Pete's white. I, I think that's all I have to say about it. The Harlem Globetrotters, I've never seen a white dude on, on, on a team, uh, especially back then. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, if nowadays they, they do incorporate um, uh, people who are white. But back then, no. So it would have been like Pistol Pete coming in and being like the star of the globe trouters <laughs> you know like it would have been a, a weird mix i kind of wish there's an alternate reality where i could have witnessed that because pistol pete and the harlem globe trouters would have been such something so crazy to see but yeah let me know in the comments am, am i off base on that one um but yeah i i don't think i've ever seen um uh a, a white dude on uh on the Harlem Globetrotters, the, to the rival, the generals, they would intentionally do that, where it would be like all white dudes on the generals, and then Harlem Globetrotters would, would, would be all, all people of color. But it would have been very interesting to see Pete Maravich with the Globetrotters back then. And that's a ton of money he turned down. Ton of money. Globetrotters, who offered Maravich $1 million to join them. Maravich dribbled the ball like a Globetrotter. Mm -hmm. He shot the ball better than all of them, and he knew every basketball trick in the book. Between the legs, yeah. behind the back, dribbling two balls at the same time, you name it. Yeah, he it's really would have been perfect for it because he did all the trick shot stuff. He did the trick dribbling. He faked out people like, like there's no tomorrow. He could spin the ball for an endless amount of time while going like the, between his legs and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. He was that guy. He's totally Harlem Globetrotter material. I never thought of it until now, but it makes perfect sense why they offered him that deal. Pistol Pete was doing it. Yep. If he had joined the Globetrotters, he would have been the first white member, but he'd fit right in because of a unique skill set. Okay. However, his dream was to play in the NBA like his dad, and the pistol was selected with the third pick by the Atlanta Hawks. Sorry, I guess that answered the question. <laughs> I guess that, okay, but let's re rephrase the question. Has anybody since then, since the 70s, has, has that happened, or have they kept the same theme? in the stacked 1970 NBA draft. In the rookie season, Maravich was under tremendous pressure after signing a contract worth nearly $2 million for five seasons. At the time, the largest contract in NBA history. Nice. However, he immediately proved that he is one of the best players in the world and that his big contract is justified. Maravich averaged 23.2 points. What is that? Two million, five years. Um, so... What is that? Two hundred, four hundred thousand dollars a year? Not bad. Not bad back then. Yeah, that that kicked down a, a, a door to to start increasing pay in the NBA. Well done. Bird and Magic uh, took it took it from there, I suppose. And four point four assists per game as a rookie, which was the eighth best scoring output. Okay, let that me see that again. I'm so sorry, you guys. Twenty three point two points a game. Okay. That season. The second season was supposed to confirm Pistol's superstar status, but he contracted mononucleosis, which caused him to lose 20 pounds. Oh, As damn. a result, Pete missed 16 games, and the illness slowed him down to 19.3 points per game. Yeah, he, he can't afford to lose any weight, especially now that he's in the pros. That sucks. But Pistol Pete would bounce back in his third season, averaging 26 points and seven assists per game, making his first all-star team and his fourth and final season with the Hawks. I hate to say it. Doesn't he look like Eric Foreman from the, the 70s show? Like, he's so thin, you guys. So thin for a professional athlete. Assists per game, making his first all-star team. In his fourth and final season with the Hawks, he was the second best scorer in the league with 27.7 points per game. But the Hawks played miserably and didn't even make the playoffs after three straight first-round playoffs. How cool is it that his jersey says pistol on it? Off accents. We got the Jazz. New Orleans Jazz joined the NBA in 1974, and in the expansion draft, they acquired Maravich from the Hawks for two players and four draft picks. By doing so, they signed the local hero, considering that the Jazz Arena was less than 100 miles away from LSU. Joining a newly established oh, wow. franchise is a double-edged sword, and Pete learned that the hard way. Yes, he was a beloved superstar, and all the fans wanted to see him play, but on the flip side, the New Orleans Jazz wasn't any good, just like most new teams are. Yeah. The Jazz didn't make the playoffs until 
until 1984, five seasons after Maravich left the team and their relocation to Utah. But even though he never made the playoffs, Pistol Pete was playing the basketball of his life with the Jazz. As one of the most unstoppable players in the league, he averaged 25.2 points and 5.6 assists in five and a half seasons with the franchise, during which he led the NBA in scoring with 31 points per game in 1977, along with three All-Star appearances and three All-NBA nods. On February 5, 1977, in a game against the New York Knicks, the Pistol scored 68 points, a career high, Damn. and at the time, the most points ever by a guard. The feat is even more <laughs> And then Jordan eventually had to outdo him by one, huh? And then Kobe had to outdo all of them. Impressive. When we know that he was guarded by Walt Frazier, one of the premier defensive guards of the 70s, and that he scored 68 without a three-pointer. In 1978, Maravich played the best all-around season of his career, averaging 27 points, 6.7 assists, and a career-high two steals per game. He would have probably nice. led the league in scoring once again and likely even pushed the Jazz to the playoffs, but he unfortunately injured his knee halfway through the season. Ouch, and was yeah, that'll slow you down. Forced to miss the final 32 games of the season. Before he got hurt, the Jazz had a winning record due to a 10-game win streak. After Maravich went down, they lost eight in a row. Yeah. Their playoff hopes were shot dead. Unfortunately for Maravich and the Jazz fans, knee injuries plagued Pete for the rest of his career, as he only played two more years in the NBA. After the Jazz moved to Salt Lake City in 1979, they traded Maravich midseason to the Celtics, where he teamed up with rookie Larry Bird. Dude, I didn't know this happened. I didn't know he, he ended his career on the Celtics with young Larry Bird. What is this, 78? 78, I think. It was the first NBA season with a three-point line, and Maravich immediately proved what kind of a shooter he was. The pistol shot 67% for three in his final Holy year. Holy shit. Can you imagine that? He'd, he'd, he'd be so good in today's game with his high tempo, his ability to pass, and the ability to shoot the long ball and also split defenses. Pistol Pete would have crushed in today's league. Here, with bad knees that severely hampered his movement. Legacy. Pistol Pete was a basketball savant, and he played basketball 30 or 40 years ahead of his time. At the time of his retirement, he had by far the best handles in NBA history, yep. and many of the greatest ball handlers took many pages out of Pete's ball handling book. He was a trendsetter that inspired generations, and if your favorite ball handler didn't learn from the pistol, they likely stole some moves from someone who stole from Pete. That LaMelo ball underhand full court pass, Berovich did that in the 70s. Yep. Magic Johnson's around the back defender freeze and then pass, Maravich did that too. Hook shot like Kareem, turnaround jumper like MJ, or readjusting his jump shot midair like Larry Bird, it was all routinely done by the pistol. When he played the game, the NBA was dominated by centers like Wilt Chamberlain and Kareem, yep. and guards like him were unicorns. Other than Jerry West, nobody else attempted that many jump shots, let alone made them with great accuracy. With an unbelievable floater and layup game, finishing with both hands, killer handles, and the ability to both score and pass, Pistol Pete is most often compared to Whoa, Steve there Nash. there it is. I I didn't know. I didn't know that this was a common thing. I thought it was just a natural progression for me to to enjoy P Pistol Pete when I was a kid and, and then enjoy Steve Nash when I was an adult. I guess there is a correlation. A guy who came to the NBA 16 years after Maravich retired. If he played in a three-point era, he would likely average around 30 points per game. And if he played in a better team, he could have easily been an MVP multiple times and won a few championships. Agreed. However, Pete didn't have the best of luck in his career and life. In one interview in 1974, Pete said, I don't want to play in the NBA for 10 years and then die of a heart attack at 40. But unfortunately, that's precisely what happened. His NBA career was cut short after 10 years due to knee injuries. And in nine of 10 seasons, his teams had a losing record. And then in 1988, almost like he predicted it, he died of a heart attack at the age of 40 when he was playing pickup basketball. Basketball. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. He called it. How does that happen? An autopsy revealed the cause of death to be a rare heart defect. He had been born with a missing left coronary artery. He lived for basketball, was a gym rat all his life, and ultimately died on the court. His last words were, I feel great. Jesus. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I didn't know. I didn't know how his story ended. He died at 40 years old while playing pickup basketball. That's so sad. 
Oh man, well that's uh, the 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 gist of Pistol Pete. Um, I would personally like to delve in deeper. Once again, I know these these kind of vids aren't going to get a lot of views. I don't care. That's not the point of the channel. What matters to me is, are you guys interested? So let me know if you guys are interested in, in some more Pistol Pete stuff. I would like to learn more. Um, I would like to get into some more specifics of his career. And um, yeah, just let me know if you guys want to go down the rabbit hole with me. Um, anyways... Yeah, it's it's funny. I didn't think about it, but the the beginnings of why I appreciate good ball handlers, guys with good handles, it's all because of him. So Allen Iverson caught my eye uh, when I was younger, and then Kyrie Irving more recently has has, has caught my attention. Steph Curry as well, um, and Steve Nash did for me as well. Like all these crazy ball handlers have uh, have always caught my attention because I just, I know how much work goes into it. It takes a lot of work to be able to to handle the ball majestically like like these guys do. But all right guys, that's Pistol Pete. Um let me know what you think. Did you guys ever watch the movie The Pistol like I did growing up? And if so, were you doing the same thing I was doing just dribbling a ball up the sidewalk up and down on the street on the asphalt even though you're killing your basketball? I did it anyways, I didn't care. Um, <laughs> all right, let me know where you guys stand on this, and I will talk to you guys soon. Have a wonderful night. Thank you for watching with me. Uh, makes it all worth it. I'll see you all in the comments later, okay? All right, have a wonderful night. Be peaceful. Have fun. And uh, tell your loved ones you love them, okay? Good night, everybody.